But I guess in a way, if you can learn something, there is always a way to unlearn it and vice versa, which is actually a really yes. helpful thing. The brain is an incredible tool to to learn. So there must be a way to unlearn it. And I guess in my own mental health journey, I've often been fascinated by my own brain as to some of my ingrained habits and how I can learn to unravel them. But yeah. 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 So I think, you know, what's interesting is the brain is there to help you learn and you will. I think of grieving as a form of learning. We have to understand, well, what is the world like now? But what's so interesting is I think that one of the funny things about the brain is there's something actively getting in the way of you learning this, right? So this is a, an example that might make sense to you. Um, so when I teach, right, for example, I teach the same course every fall. I teach a psychology of death and loss course, and I often teach it in the same lecture hall. And, you know, the students sit in the same place, you know, through the semester. And, and by the end of the semester, I know the students pretty well. I know some of their stories and their personalities. And when the class ends and then I go back to the lecture hall the following fall and I walk in, I never expect to see those same students in those seats, right? Like, <laughs> It is one trial learning. I no one never have I thought, oh gosh, I was expecting to see, you know, so and so <laughs> there. So if the brain can learn that so instantaneously, then what is the problem in grieving? And I think mm -hmm. that the problem is when we have an attachment relationship, when we're bonded with another person, with our one and only, you know child or spouse or best friend or whoever it is, that attachment is encoded in the brain with this implicit belief. You will always be there for me. I will always be there for you. And what it means is even when we're not in the room with that person, we still know that they're mm -hmm. out there for us, right? And so that belief, that implicit subconscious belief gets in the way of the new learning that they're not actually there. I mean, I love my students, but I am not attached to them in that <laughs> yeah. way. right? And so that attachment neurobiology, I think actually prevents us from learning for a while. And that's why we do things like, you know, how many of us have picked up the phone to text our loved one and then realized, oh, wait, I can't do that anymore. And then thought, of course, have I lost my mind? But you haven't mm -hmm. lost your mind. It's that you're still on a learning curve. Part of your, you know, one stream of information in your brain knows the reality. And another stream of information in your brain has this implicit belief that they're out there. And those two can't both be true. And so you go through that grief over and over again as, the, as those two conflicting beliefs sort of butt up against each other. But eventually our brain does learn. It, it learns to predict, oh, wait, no, this, this, this is not a person that I'm going to see again. I'm not going to, to hug them again. It doesn't mean I don't have all those brilliant memories and it doesn't mean I can't call them to mind and even have a conversation with them, but I no longer expect them when I walk into a room. Mm. So what's the the difference between grief and grieving? Before I even came across your work, I, I, I didn't know there was a difference. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, most of us don't use those two words differently, obviously. This actually came about because of the science I was doing. So I was, you know, doing neuroimaging scans with very kind and courageous participants who were willing to to get into a neuroimaging scanner and and let me show them photos um, that they brought me that I scanned into the computer uh, so that they would look at a photo of their loved one you know on goggles while they're lying in the scanner so that I could look at what how is their brain activated in response to that and that is a wave of grief isn't it you know grief is that in the moment it's that wave of thoughts and feelings and, and memories and, and all of that. But at the end of that study, I realized I now knew a lot about how the brain enables us to feel that wave of grief. But many of the questions that I had 
we're actually about grieving, about how does that grief change over time, right? So I would need to bring the same participant back multiple times and do imaging scans to see not what parts of the brain reacted in the moment, but what parts of the brain changed over time as we learned that this person was no longer, you know, on this earthly plane. And so grieving is the way that grief changes over time. It's the, it's the, it's, you know, for most of us, waves of grief become less frequent or less intense as, as, you know, we learn to, to understand, we learn to accept the reality, or even if they don't become, you know, less intense, waves of grief can be intense even years after we've lost someone, but they can become more familiar, right? We know kind of, oh, I know what this is, and maybe I know how to comfort myself or soothe myself in the midst of this moment. And I know that it's not, it's not going to last. It's a wave, right? And, and so all of those things mean that over time, we incorporate grief into our ongoing life. Grief doesn't go away, but we change because we understand it, because we can build a life that includes waves of grief, along with waves of happiness and joy and silliness and all the other many things that life offers. My grief for my stepfather felt very different to um, the grief for my nan. And I think possibly because of my grief for my stepfather was sudden and um, I, there was there were a lot yeah. of unthings said that I really wanted to say. So it wasn't wrapped up in a nice little bow, whereas my nan, you know, it was a passing and I got to say goodbye to her. So, yeah. And, and so the step, my, my grief with my stepfather, I kind of, it, I didn't even, my mom says I didn't even cry at his funeral. And I, I mm -hmm. just, it manifested in some very unhealthy coping mechanisms. So, but I didn't know what I needed at the time. So can you talk right. a little bit about uh, delayed grief, prolonged grief? <laughs> why I experience grief in a different way and, and how the body, like I just, I, I don't know how I could have forced it out into some magical process that, you know, the five stages of grief that I've researched and you can talk a little bit about that, but, but yeah. So I think, you know, you really, you've hit the nail on the head, so to speak. Each grief that we experience is as different as the relationship. I mean, your relationship, presumably with your nan and your stepfather, were also very, very different. My relationship with my mother and father were very, very different. And so grief is really about that relationship. And it means that the grief is going to look different based on how old you are, how well you know yourself at the moment when this is happening. It's going to be different based on how expected it was, right? So our unexpected losses are, you know, they really rip the rug out from under us, right? If the brain is already having difficulty predicting, then if there's no, no forewarning, that's a, that's an even harder thing for the brain to comprehend. If you enjoyed this video, then you can listen to the full episode on your preferred podcast platform. And please do connect with me on my social media pages for additional content, latest flipper updates, and where you can find out how you can get involved with the show. Because together, we can discover and share more stories and voices that deserve to be heard.